We are looking at the word of God in the book of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and that's where we're going to be. My name is Brian Moshigadi. I am born again, and Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. It is the honor of, God, of my life to serve God and his people here at DCIK, and Bishop Dr. Jimmy and Pastor Alice Kimani. In case you're our visitor, Karibu Sana, 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 we thank God that you're here with us. So Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 1 to verse 30. We're not going to read all of them. We'll just gloss over it, and then we'll get into it, the Lord allowing us time. The Bible says, now it came to pass, I'm reading in the New King James, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, go. And tell John the things which you hear and the things which you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We'll skip just a little bit along and go to verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. We want to push it just a little bit further and go to the verses right there in verse 25. And he says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have not hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it so seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows except, um, no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal to him. And he says in verse 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray that you would breathe life upon it. I pray that you would cause it to enter into our souls, and as it enters, let it bring light where there is darkness, and let it make the simple wise, because we pray these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're just looking at a little bit of where we are. By the time we're getting to Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is already in the earth. He's doing his work of ministry. He's already been born of the Virgin Mary. He has not yet suffered under Pontius Pilate, but Jesus is doing his work of ministry. Just from what he sends the disciples of John to tell him, they, we can see that the blind eyes have been opened, the lame are walking, the lepers have been cleansed, the deaf here, the dead have already been raised up. By this time, the poor have gotten the gospel preached to them. Jesus has preached the gospel and done the things that he said he's coming to do. He's not yet done, but he's on the journey of doing those things. If you're wondering what Jesus' assignment was, it looks like in John, not John, in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, if you read it, that is the anchor verse for Deliverance Church International, that is what Jesus Christ came to do. So when Jesus is in the earth, he is doing exactly what he had said he's coming to do. And that's the response that he gives to the people. The working title that I have for today is Come to Jesus, okay? Wonderful. So Jesus has already, be, has already done his ministry. He's already doing his ministry. It's not yet over, but he's well on his way of doing these things. Now, the person that we introduced to here, Jesus has commissioned some of his disciples to go out, actually his disciples, and he sent them out to go to the cities that are around there. And then Jesus goes to other towns. So he's sending and dispersing the disciples. You go and comb that side of town, and you guys go and comb that side of the city, and I will go to this other side of the city and comb it. So Jesus has gone out, and they are doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. Now, John the Baptist hears in prison the works of Christ. John the Baptist, who is a relative of Jesus, indeed a cousin of Jesus, so John hears what Jesus Christ is doing. Now, just to take you a little bit back about the relationship, the special unique bond that John and Jesus shared. First, it was a family bond. If you go to the beginnings of the Gospels, we find here that the angel comes and brings the good news to, Jesus, to the mother of John the Baptist. 
Okay? The mother of John the Baptist, who is called? Elizabeth. The angel comes and brings the, the news to her husband first, who is inside the temple, performing the things that a priest is supposed to be performing. Now, these people are old, both of them. And then on top of that, Elizabeth is also barren. So, jo um, Zechariah and Elizabeth are old and barren. They've waited for a child. The child did not come in their honeymoon years. The child did not come in their 10th year anniversary. The child did not come after that. The child did not come now. They have even stopped. They are just waiting for the redemption of Israel. But the Lord comes through for them and finds the father inside doing his priestly duties. Back in the day when it was a serious thing to go into the Holy of Holies. This is before the death of Jesus Christ, of course, before even his birth. So inside the Holy of Holies, the, the, the story goes that when people used to go back there, they used to be fungiliwad with a rope or some chain of sorts. Because it was such serious business going into the Holy of Holies, it, if you went there and came in a manner that was unfit, a manner that was not presentable to God, that if you had sinned, the Lord would strike you inside there. So they had to do this entire ritual of purification upon themselves. If you read it in the early days when the Lord is speaking and giving his commands to them in the wilderness, the Israelites in the wilderness, in Leviticus, you will find that the Lord gives them rules on how to take care of themselves. The Lord was so serious as he is even today only that we water it down. But the Lord was so serious to them, he would even tell them about how to dispose of their waste. They did not have the toilets that we have today. So he would tell those of them who are priests that they should each have a shovel in their own hand. And they should go out. When it is time for them to do the number two, they were supposed to go out and chimba unafanya number two na unaifunika in a way that Nobody will know. The Bible says, lest the Lord should walk in the camp and find something that is unclean and unholy. The Lord is so specific about the cleanliness of the people. He goes go down to the details, telling them this is what you need to do. Imagine God giving you even the details on how to do the number two. He was serious about purity. So in those days, as they are going into the Holy of Holies, and nobody can come inside there to get you out. So what used to happen was that ukikaka kidogo uko na ume delay wanatingiza kamba hivi. Kama uko alive na wewe unafanya nini? Una respond, unatuma ka SMS. Unawaambia niko niko bado guys, niko. Wakifanya hivyo ukose ku respond. Wanajua oh kumeharibika, wanaanza kuvuruta mtu wao marehemu ndio hiyo sasa story yako imeishia hapo. So in anyway, John um John's father Zechariah is inside there and he's doing the work that he was supposed to be doing. And the angel appears to him and comes and brings him news. Now Zechariah does not believe. So the Lord says, okay, it shall still be done to you, but I will take away from you the ability to enjoy this process. You will not be able to speak. So he did not speak. He went and had to speak to his wife. And I don't know how he signed to his wife and tell, to tell her that I got a word today and you and I need to do the thing so that the Lord has instructed. Imagine how difficult it must have been for him to give that information, being mute himself. But anyway, Elizabeth got pregnant according to the promise of the Lord. She went away by herself for about five months, just saying, this is what the Lord has done to regard my unfortunate estate. Now, the angel comes to appear to Mary, and because the things that he was saying to Mary were big things, that a virgin, it had never happened before then, has not happened again now. Imagine he's coming to tell her that you, as a virgin girl, are going to get pregnant, and you're going to carry the savior of the world. Mary listens to this story. Unbelievable as it is, she says, I am the maidservant of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. But before that, the Lord says to Mary, See, your relative also Elizabeth, who was old and barren, is now pregnant. She is heavy with child. Now, that was about five or six months before that. When Mary hears that God is doing impossible things with somebody, as he's doing impossible things in her body, what does she do? She packs up her things, goes to the hill country to visit Elizabeth. When they meet, when Elizabeth and Mary meet, the babe inside Mary, no, the babe inside of Elizabeth, sorry, leaps. This is not just kicking. It's an leap. Iyo ni John the Baptist na Yesu wakigoteana. Shakuta. We're looking at the unique relationship that they had between the two of them. So, from that point, these people have made... Elizabeth is excited. She's like, who am I that I would be so honored as to receive the mother of my Lord? What a blessedness it is. So, from that time, Jesus and John the Baptist are... They are con contemporaries. I mean, contemporaries. And they are close to each other. 
Now, if John the Baptist had been the honeymoon baby of Elizabeth and Zechariah, he would be too old by the time Jesus is coming to be born. And Jesus needed to come at the exact time that he came. So the delay that may have inconvenienced Zechariah and his wife a little bit was a scripted delay. God needed that that child will come at exactly that time so that he can be the actual forerunner of Jesus, even going to baptize him in the Jordan. May I speak to a few people that are struggling with delay in the house today. Just that you may understand that the delay you are in may be scripted by God. The Lord is allowing that a little time lapses because you know you want it, but the Lord needs it for something. So it may take a little bit longer, a little, a little while longer, but just hang in there. Turn to your neighbor, tell them neighbor, hang in there. If the Lord has a plan for your life, beloved, you must be careful to hang in there and not throw up your hands and say, God does not even care about me. I am waiting for him to do this thing and I am keeping myself right. Guess who else was keeping themselves right? Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. In fact, the Bible says Elizabeth, even though they were devout and loving the Lord, Elizabeth came from a priestly lineage, the priestly lineage of Aaron. Zechariah himself was a priest. So they were doing the right things in the right way. So the fact that they were barren and without child was not their fault. It was not out of, the Lord was not punishing them. But you may easily find, I would imagine, in their day as they walked around, there would be people around them who are looking at them and saying, Oi, these people and the way they serve God faithfully. Imagine Awana Katoto. Iyo miakayote imagine. Awana ngojea tuivo. Mina wana nganika kuna kitu mtu anazakua. Mtu wakiji search. Do you remember the friends of Job? The friends of Job appear to him and they start to say, hey, if I were you, me, I would go to God and present my case. Because there must be something. Job, ni nini utuambi? Fungua roho yako, Job. Sini mabeshi yako, hakuna malita kupeleka. Fungua roho. Ile dhambi unafanya, sasa ndiyo hii mungu imekuja kukufind out. Ongea na sisi, bro, si chomeke. Tuwa kusaidia. Hai, endelea kuficha mambo yako, basi. Job is like, I have done nothing. Man, I have done nothing. But these people are like, no, 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 no. Mtu wezi ya kapiti hivi, umuaisi kia wapi kutoka kuumbwe dunia, ati umepoteza watoto wako, the same day, umepoteza mbuzi, camels, na wende ulikuwa sauce kati yetu, alafu all of a sudden, hauna kitu, ah, wee, wacha mambo yako. Alafu on top of that, sasa umayata umepata terminal disease, kuna maboil squad, ah, wee, wacha. Kuna kitu unafanya, na ni mungu sasa hamekuja kuku. That may be true in some cases. But some of you seated in the place, you know you're going through a rough season and you know it is not that there's something you have done. You're waiting on the Lord faithfully. And you feel like you want to throw in the towel because why is the Lord not coming for me? I tell you, hang in there. The delay may be scripted. Because the Lord required for it to happen. We shared in the first service, we were talking about the National Geographic. If you like to watch those animals, by now you know I'm a big fan. If you like to watch those animals, the lion is just lying in wait. The zebras are passing. These are herd of zebras or gazelles. If the lion were to use the same software that you and I use, the lions would die hungry. Because us, the first sighting of zebra, jump on it. No calculation, no nothing. You're just like, hey, in your opportunity, mekuja. you run into it without thinking. Now, the lion does not do that. It lies in wait. The first zebra passes. The second one comes. They are past machine. Bono nachaziende. You need lunch, bro. Zitaisha, zitaisha. But the lion knows if you attack too early, you scare off all of them. Your chances of getting one are very slim. If you attack too late, your lunch is definitely gone. So you have to time it correctly. Now, if these are animals of the field that have this kind of wisdom, how much more the creator of heaven and earth, who looks at your situation with the kind of perspective he has, he knows this, my child, is asking for this thing, and I know they would need it, but I need it for some greater good as well. If I give it to them a little too early, it will destroy them. If I give it to them too late, their hearts will be crushed and finished. So at the right time, the scriptures would remind us, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, hang in there. If you're thinking about the kind of delay, just from the very story of 
uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. We find it right there. The Lord had need that John the Baptist came at exactly the time that John the Baptist came. Not a day earlier, not a time late. So the Lord had a few people needed to be inconvenienced. So what if you're inconvenienced by the Lord? It might be painful. We are not throwing that out. It might be uncomfortable, but the Lord is going to come. And when the Lord comes... Somebody said, the psalmist actually, it is better one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. When the, Lord, when the day of the visitation of the Lord comes, the, the psalmist again says that we, when the Lord came, when he turned again our misfortunes, we were like those who do what? Like those who dream. When the Lord comes to your situation, finally, because he will, when he comes, you shall enjoy it. Una kitu unajiambia hata nilikuwa na ngoje, nilikuwa na stress nini. Afadhali kungoja mungu. Bwana iso sifiwe. May the Lord visit somebody today. And for those of you who your visitation is not coming today, may the Lord encourage you to wait on him. Do not give up on God. So John the Baptist and Jesus go a long ways back. They are friends. They've been contemporaries. John actually comes and baptizes Jesus Christ. Now, in the baptism, John, con he confirms, this is the Messiah. This is the one. Points at him and says, this is the one. Now, John knows that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus Christ himself knows that he's the Messiah. Because during that baptism in Matthew 4 or Luke 4, you will find that the heavens open. There comes upon him uh, the Holy Spirit in form of a dove. And the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So God affirms the sonship of Jesus Christ right there. So Jesus has no doubt that he's the son of God, the Messiah that is to come. John has no doubt in that moment because he was there. Everybody heard it. But John, now, where we just read, has been thrown in prison. So John is in prison. This John the Baptist is in prison, and Jesus is doing his ministry. So it says, when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, to go and say to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now, because a few things were not adding up. You know, it is okay for you to believe somebody is the Messiah when you're outside there having the time of your life. But when you're in prison for one day, two days, three days, a couple of days, and then you know you are a prophet, you know you are on the same side as this Messiah, and this Messiah is not coming to break you out, you start to wonder, I'm a Messiah, see Messiah. Bona Jakam. Because let's be honest, for us believers, we like to think that because we're on the same side as Jesus, we are on the same side. We need to enjoy all the benefits of being on the same side with Jesus. We feel it all the time. John the Baptist, when he's in prison, sometimes because of how things are looking, and that imprisonment was not. Because and those of us who have connections here can help you. There's that one. Lakini kuna kufungwa jela ile yenye president ndiyo amesema ushikwe, ukamatwe, <laughs> mnakumbuka hiyo kibaki. Ye ndiyo amerequest, ufungwe. Hey my friend, wewe uwezi ukaatiliwa. Hadi president mwenyewe aseme. Now why was John the Baptist in prison? I might want to ask. John the Baptist was in prison because there's something that he had done. Hakuwa amefungwa ati kwa sababu ya tu, ati alikuwa amefungiwa. Now there's a king a descendant of the Herod that was there in the day when Jesus was being born, called Herod Antipas of Galilee. He went to visit his brother in Rome. This is a true story, by the way. So he went to visit his brother in Rome. During that visit, he seduced his brother's wife. So umetoka umenda kutembelea brother yako, unaenda unapata mke wa ndugu yako, ameweza. Sawa. Iyo ni luga ya youth service. Okay. So unaenda unapata ako hivo. So he seduced her. When he went back to his place, when he went back to his home, he dismissed his wife, divorced her, and married his sister-in-law, whom he had lured away from her husband, who was his brother. Now, when John the Baptist heard about this, he publicly and sternly rebuked Herod. Now, it was not safe then, and it is not even safe now. Okay, now we have a few things that are easy. But it was not safe to speak out against a president or a king like that. He, and that king was a despot. He was just... Horrible. You know, these days we make fun of our presidents. You know, you can, you can just create a meme about the president. We see them made fun of. Is it called caricature in the newspapers? We make fun of them. But there are some countries where you cannot talk about the supreme leader. 
You can't. You make fun about them. Unapata milango yako imevunjwa. Even in Kenya, back in the day, it used to be that way. I mean, I didn't live in those days. I mean, I hear about it. Some of you did, though. <laughs> but John had the boldness to speak out against that evil. Because it was evil then, it is evil now. You don't just take somebody else's wife. It's wrong. So John the Baptist spoke against it, and he spoke about it, against it publicly. So Herod was angry, took this man, threw him in prison. He would have killed him, only that he knew. The people celebrated him. The people considered him a prophet come from God. So he did not have his way with just throwing him in prison and locking him up inside there. Otherwise, if he had, he would have killed him. Though we can find, if you read it, we won't look at it now, in the book of Matthew chapter 14, just a little bit later from verse 3 there, you will find the story where he finally had his way, that the wife asked for the neck of John the Baptist on a platter, and they've had their, they had their way. So before that, that was, that was before that. So John is in prison. His imprisonment is ordered by the king himself, so you know he's going nowhere. And if there is suffering, you know, anakapitia kweli kweli uko jela. Yes, he, at the guest of the state, Vinyotunasemanga, guest of the state, he's not being put in good conditions. He spoke publicly against the king and his decisions. So the people who are serving him are making sure they pass a message, wamemfunga kiasi kwamba, iwe funzo kwake na kwa wengine wenye nini. Tabia kama. So he's really going through it in prison, you would imagine. So after staying there, he hears that Jesus is out there doing things in his ministry. So he gets a bit confused and a bit doubtful. He's wondering, ah, oh, we are on the same side. Why would he not come to break me out? By that time, they were all waiting for the redemption of Israel. The Messiah was coming to redeem Israel. So you would expect that the Messiah is going to come in a grand way to break down doors, to just go and break out all the people who are living their right lives. And John was one of them. So they are all wondering, including himself, why has he not come to break me out? We are on the same side. Sometimes doubt begins to creep in. And you may be there wondering, I John the Baptist, nah, but think about your own personal life. Because you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you're living with him. Sometimes you stop to ask yourself, why is Jesus allowing that I go through all these things? We're on the same side as him, don't we? We sit down and we ask ourselves, why would the Lord not come to my aid? Why is the Lord not showing these people? Have you ever been in a place and you're the believer, and then the non-believers are making fun of you because of something that's not going right? Maybe it's in your family, maybe it's at your place of work. Everybody's just looking down on you and making it, you're making you a public display of shame. They are making fun at you, they are poking fun, they are just, you know, and you're wondering, hmm, let these people, God, my God will come and show them, show them all of us that I am there. Many of us sometimes as believers, we have that chip on our shoulder that we walk around with and we expect God to come and break down, dramatically break down doors and just put a huge amount of money in your bank, poop, because you are a Christian. My God shall supply. Most of the prayers that we make, if you look at it, beloved, they are very selfish prayers. There are prayers that just, if the Lord answered them, the world will be in trouble. Umeingia kwa matatu, umelipa pesa. Iyo pesa umelipa, umengojea change. Makanga amekataa nayo. Ame umeitisha pesa, anakata, umeitisha, anasema, nini ni wengojea? Finally, unashuka bila change yako. Ata ukishuka, unambia, ya nipatia, anasema, awe, hakuna pesa, change, jafika, ngoja, tufika stage ya mwisho. Unasema, stage ya mwisho ni town, mina shukia hapa mutai gabwana. Unanambia, niende ya stage ya mwisho kwa sababu, nipatia yu pesa tu. Na yu unajue vinyo mfuko inakasa hizi. Anambia, we, ni nini we, mama, unanisumbua, we, nda huko hata ununua gari yako. Ba. Unashuka hapo, unasikia, anasema, kijana, unachua mungu wana kwa, eh, mungu nini we, hata kuniambia mamba wa muwe, nda. Ukishuka hapo, unashuka aje, na holy anga indignation. Unasema, oh God, oh God, my father, my father. My case is... <laughs> so my case is urgent. God, show these people that I am your servant. Oh God. Igari isifike pale chini. Ikwame. Ndiyo nikipita hapo. Nipate na fasi ya kuambia. Gari haikwami. Na watafika kule wanaenda. Na uo kondakta hata kufa. Hata endelea kuishi. Mambio na mtu. Nunu waya kuna sema mungu nipatie gari. Nikitoka hivi nipatane na mtu. Like in a Nigerian movie. Mtu wakupatie tufungua kwa mbie. My sister I just want to bless you. 
No, I couldn't let our testimony. You know, the other day I was just here and some non believers just joked with me. And they were telling me, no, no, I have to say, jelly. But the Lord touched her sister and she came and she gave me her keys and she said, the Lord has. Oh, my brothers. You know, we think that is the testimony, Sindio. We are like John the Baptist. We are wondering, I am on his side. Why is he not coming to break me out? Uko kwa nyumba umefungiwa. Na watu wanajua uko ndio fellowship inatende kanga. Oi, aitu landlord, anaitu anini umungine? Kiateka, usunajua ma kiateka. Kiateka, anakuja, anakuambia, eh hey, mama, ni nini? Siuombe mungu wa kupatia pesa ya rent na ndio mnaombanga uku kwa ni nini? Unasikia, ai. My God, it is us. They are touching us. The, the church is under attack. God, you must do something. God, give me my own house. Tomorrow, ndio nikipita hapa. Make me the landlord. <laughs> well, sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Most of the times, actually, it doesn't. And you get angry. You get offended. You're wondering, why is God not answering me even when I have poured myself out to him like this? God, I have given you everything. What do we call everything? That you pray the way you're supposed to pray? You read your Bible the way you are supposed to read it. You fellowship with the Holy Spirit the way you are supposed to do it. But to us, everything, God, I have given you everything. And still you are doing this to me. You even, you are saying, I will no longer pray, I can't pray anymore. Ah, you become like John. Now you are sending, not your disciples, but you are sending the ladies' prayer group, the men's prayer group, the youth group, you are sending them. Just, I'm just so mad at God. I don't understand why God would do such a thing to me like this. I have done everything. I am living a devout life. Why wouldn't God just step into the picture and just show himself strong? Sometimes we are asking God to show himself strong, but when he does, it is not for the benefit of the kingdom. It is ndio wajue. So sa zingine reason yenye bado hiyo gari haijakuja ni kwa sababu Mungu anajua akikupatia hiyo gari itakuwa upige safari kwenda to the village. Umepigisha gari safari barabara pa 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 ndi uende tu kwa the village the first weekend hata gari haija toka wanga unaipeleka huko ndi uende upitie kwa nyumba ya wale ma anti unangangana kupark huko kwa hata hakuna gari inaingianga kuna kabarabara ya miguu lakini unataka ufinye gari hapo ndi ukishuka unazungusha fungu unasema mko salama mko huku bado Nifungulieni boot ni watolee shopping nimekuja kuwabariki. Kwa sa- hiyo baraka si baraka ila ni kejeli watu wa Mungu. Hata wewe umeenda kuwa show lakini unaweka hapo juu by God. Ni God unajua silipi mabaya kwa mabaya mimi. Ndio maana nimekuja nitolee hapo kwa boot. Hapo kwa co-driver is God glorified in that? No, these people are not wondering oh wow the Lord has they are seeing you. Wewe tu ndio <laughs> Jesus, when he's answering John the Baptist, the disciples, does not say, yes, I am the Messiah. Go and tell him, yes. Because John, and as I may lose the focus kidogo, he gets it back immediately, by the way. He may have lost the focus kidogo because of the circumstances he was in, but Jesus was not confused about who he was. So he didn't need to prove it to anybody. What did he do? He sent the disciples and said, go and tell him what you see. The blind can see and the lame can walk. The deaf can hear. The lepers are cleansed. The dead are raised. Go and tell him what you see. If you're struggling in that position, if your heart is feeling offended by God, this is not the time for you to leave the fellowship of believers. It is the time for you, in fact, to go and see what the Lord is doing. Set yourself up in places where God is doing things. Hear what the Lord is doing. Tune in to listen to sermons. Hear what the Lord is doing. Sit around people. Go to your cell meeting. Go to the ladies and to the men's fellowship. Go to the youth meetings. Sit around them and hear what is God doing for other people. You'll realize God is still doing the things that God does. Because whether he has done it for you or not, God is still good. Hey, turn to your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor, God is good anyhow. God is not good because he's good to me. God is good, full stop. To me, it is neither here nor there. God is good. Whether I believe that he's good to me or not, he's neither here nor there, beloved. God is good. In him, there is no injustice. The Bible calls us and says, Ascribe faithfulness to our God, the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are 
pure. God is good. He says, our God of faithfulness without injustice. Good and upright is he. God is good anyhow. So if you're struggling and you're in a place where you're wondering, after I have fasted and prayed like this, why would God do such a thing to me? What do you mean to you? That is what you're supposed to be doing. They might have been so faithful, and then this is what the Lord has repaid me with. I repaid you. What is this transaction? We see transaction. If, for instance, you take care of your child, the toddlers who you know they cannot support themselves. A few of my friends have been getting children lately, so I've been doing the uncle duties. I'm just going to Shikilia Kichon and be like, let me just ask those of you who are parents, by the way, this is not useful to our sermon today, but what is that thing about patotos dui kichwa ina nino? Semozi ya kia apo, roho ikwa apo. Why are you scaring those of us who haven't gotten there yet? Emma, how can I handle somebody whose head, the heart is in their head? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> when you're taking care of your child who is that ka, tiny ka baby like that, you do it because it is your responsibility. Yes. That child did not make applications to be born in that home. You asked the Lord for a child, and the Lord graciously gave you the child. So now it is your responsibility. When the nights are long and they are crying, when the baby is colicky, <laughs> and blowing through all the diapers, and they don't care how the economy is looking like, you can't be complaining. After all I have done for them, they are still here crying and crying. I will not take care of them again. Do you do that? It is what you are supposed to do. You are not looking at it as a transaction. You can't. It's not transactional. It sounds as absurd when we start to say, after all I have done for God. What do you mean? After all God has done for me, let me recommend a song to you. Look for a song called The Gratitude. Actually, listen to that song because we will sing it here one day. And So look for a song on YouTube called The Gratitude by J.J. Hairstone. No, it's, it's actually called What Have You Not Done For Me by a team called The Gratitude and J.J. Hairstone. On YouTube. It's available on YouTube. All you need is just bundles. Kidogo to I'm a Wi-Fi. Now, when you listen to the song, you start to ask yourself, Enyewe, what have you not done? It's the last song I listened yesterday before the lights went out. Um... <laughs> yeah. Leo kiona ndugu yako yako na nguo imenini. Usimulize maswali. Wacha. Wacha mambo nyingi. Wacha. Hata mtu alichelewa leo kwa team za tu waulizi maswali leo. It coming to touch as a sacrifice. <laughs> anyway, you see it's good that I'm preaching to Kenyans. Sasa ningekuwa na ubiria wazungu hata wajui stima inapotea anga mambo kama hiyo. You know it's so good. Anyway, you ask yourself, the song is asking, what have you not done for me? So uh, in, in response, I will give you a shout, I will give you a run, I will do things. Because what have you not done for me? When you sit down to ask yourself, what has God not done for you? You realize all the things we are here complaining about, he's not broken me out of prison. What do you mean? And I'm in this prison breathing in and out. I would rather die. That is the pride of the highest degree. May the Lord deliver us from that in Jesus' name. May that not be our portion. May we look around and see people who God is doing things for and have the attitude that our man, Pastor Alice, likes to tell us. If the Lord is working, even though he's not working on me, I know I am next. Unafika kwa ATM, unapata laini mrefu. All I need to do is, is it working? Nauliza uyo kwa hapa, inafanya? Anakwambia ee. Because now the madness is to be to line up behind an ATM that is not working. Systems zimekufa. Lakini tumesimama hapo. Unauliza, inafanya? Sijui. Unauliza inafanya? Sijui. Ulipata tu laini unaingia? Eh, inafanya? Sijui. Now that is madness. But if you come and you ask inafanya? Yes. You wait there. Ama anakwambia unafanya? System ina kaiko slow kidogo lakini inafanya na una watu wakiingia na wanatoka. Then you stand in line. That's why the fellowship of believers is so important. You go to believers you hear what God is doing in their lives. It is your way of asking inafanya. Wanasema Deal. So you stand in line and you wait on the Lord because the Lord surely does come.
So the Lord says to John the, the Baptist's disciples, yes, he just go and tell him what you can see. People are being healed. People's sight is being restored. The Messiah is truly here because that's what the Messiah had come to do. He had come to open the eyes of the blind. He had come to open the ears of the deaf. He had come to put movement to the people who are lame. He was coming to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Go and tell him what you're seeing. When the report got to John, oh my goodness, I would imagine the joy and celebration. The blind are walking. The, no, the blind are seeing. The lame are walking. Oh, those people who are poor are receiving the good news. I am in prison, but the Messiah is here. That must be our attitude. I have not seen an answer to what I am waiting for, but the Messiah is in our midst. God is with me. He is doing the things that only he can do. So they depart. And when they depart, Jesus starts to bring the news to the people. Now he starts commending John the Baptist to the people. Telling them, when you went out to the wilderness, what did you see? You, were you going to look for a reed that was shaken by the wind? In the wilderness, those things do not exist. When you went to the wilderness, were you going to look for a man that was in soft clothes and soft garments? No, those ones are in palaces. When you went into the wilderness, you knew what you were going to look for. You went out and you found a prophet. And I say to you, indeed, even more than a prophet. Commending John the Baptist. So as Jesus is speaking, he gets to verse 12 while well, he's commending John the Baptist, and he says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And this is greatly misinterpreted in most of the times. We, there's a lot of argument about what exactly is Jesus referring to here. Is he saying that whatever I want, I need to get it by hook or by crook? Do I need to put people down? I will do anything in my power to make sure that whatever I want is what I... That is a world full of anarchy, isn't it? But he's speaking about... The, he places weight, first of all, on that the kingdom of heaven did not just come the way it is... The way, it didn't just come lightly. You must remember, Jesus speaking about his own ministry himself, that for the kingdom to be transferred or to be, for us to be brought, let me put it that way, for us to be included in the kingdom, it was not just a declaration that was made from heaven. He did not just stand at the balcony of heaven and say, you are now part of the kingdom. No, he had to come down into the earth. When you think about the agony and the suffering and the pains that he endured at Calvary, that is violence at its highest. It was not delivered to us lightly. The matters of the kingdom are not light. It is not easy. It is not casual. Something heavy happened so that we can get what we have, so that we can be brought into the kingdom. For me to be able to say I am a child of God, there was something huge. There was violence that went into it. There was force. It was taken by force. So much that blood had to be shed. So much that somebody had to die. Jesus is not just faint. Imagine how chaotic it would have been if we say Jesus fainted for me. That doesn't communicate any seriousness, does it? Jesus had to die. He had to suffer and bleed. That's why the death of Jesus was so dramatic. He was whipped out of form. His head was bruised and battered. They put on him a crown of thorns. If you've gone to the encounter, you've seen just a semblance of what the crown of thorns looked like. It was a real crown of thorns. And they put it into his head. So much so that his head began to swell and become even twice, about twice its natural size. He was pierced from one side to the other. These are things that we read and sometimes we may think, did these things really happen to this person? They did. It was not a small matter for the kingdom to be communicated to us or to be brought to us. Something had to happen. Something great. The kingdom of heaven, since the days of Uko, suffered violence. And the violent... Take it by force. Now, as I was reading the commentaries, I found one of the, um, in one of the commentaries, it mentions that there's a Sunday school teacher who went to her pastor, and she was asking the pastor, pastor, I'm trying to just think that I feel so discouraged because I have been teaching Sunday school all these years, and all these years, no child has ever said, I want to give my life to Christ. I have never seen transformation of even one child. So she was so discouraged, wondering, is this thing working? And the pastor just said to her, how much have you wanted it? Have you been violent about it? And the woman goes about and she's like, what do you mean? Like pinch them into salvation? Beat them? I've never done that, but I can consider it. Is that how they're going to give them? 
Is that how they're going to give their lives to Christ? Do I need to pinch them? Some of you have children and children who are not born again. They haven't yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ yet. It is coming in Jesus' name. But some of you have those kinds of children. You know you cannot beat your child into salvation. You know you cannot pinch them into salvation. Maybe when they are young, but when they grow up, they start to realize, in fact, they will even hate it the more. Now, you can do everything in your power while they are still under your roof to make sure that while they are there, they practice the thing. So you have family altar. Pray together. They may not like it, but kwa nani yuko wanyumba ni kwa nani? Ni kwa nani jamani? Si ni kwako? Yeah, so while they are still in your care, please, by all means, if you have family, ukitaka kuweka family altar, weka. Ukitaka kusema, i family altar, kila mtu wanaishi yuku, lazima kuje, eka. And I hear those stories. Some of my young people, um, we talk about this uh, in, their, in their homes. Kwa sababu baba anayendanga kazi five, <laughs> five, lazima wakue sitting room wote. Even if you're going nowhere yourself. Wewe kuja muombe, alafu and everybody. And I thought, what? I love it so much. Oh Lord God Almighty. If I had my family by this time, I'd be like, yetu ni for that. For that. <laughs> But do it by all means while they're under your roof. A uh, 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 bishop has reminded us many times about tokology and neology. Tokology is the art of talking. Wazazi si mnajua mambo ya kuongea? Ongea. Ongea anakuambia mama huyu anaongea kwa hilo wakati ongea tena. Mimi niamsia ongea. Sasa sema this house has no peace. Wewe ongea. Si ni kwako. Utakatazwa aje kuongea huko nje kwa ofisi na pia kwako ukatazwa kuongea. Ongea. And then the other one is neology. Neology is the art of kneeling down to pray for them. If as their parent you are not praying for them, sasa kama wazazi wetu wa mtuombei jamani, let me tell you some of the memes that the young people share, that we share amongst ourselves. Say, thank God for the prayers of our parents. Thank God for the prayers of my mother. Thank God for the prayers of my father. Now imagine if you are not praying for them, what are we doing out here? How are we surviving? Lazima mtuombei watu wa mungu. We are training them to also pray for themselves because the prayers of a parent alone are not enough. But you cannot abscond that duty of praying for yourself. Now, however, you know that you cannot do anything much but talk and pray. Because wakisha fika level ingine, hasa hata kuobey ni kazi. Now the responsibility they have is to honor. You know obeying you ni pale wakiwa adogo. Children, obey your parents in there. Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. A time for obedience in Itaisha. Mtu wakona boma lake, Pastor Richard na wakona Pastor Paris na wakona their two children. Alafu watisasa mzazi kule nyumbani ya nasema, ninataka unitumie 40,000 size ya amu ya father. Utataka sana baba, utataka kabisa? Hata ujoi itaka zaidi ya hivo. Lakini utatuma, utatuma. Utatuma, ukona maitaji yako, you have your own family. So obedience imeisha, but honor. Now how you respond to them when they tell you such a thing? It now communicates whether you honor them or not. Hama namna gani? You're able to tell them, hey, baba, yo, maneno. Ningumu, umetisha 40,000? Wacha ni kutumie 400. Ndiyo ni konayo sa. Lakini umabii, we, mze, we, we, ukona wazimu. Ukizeeka, unaendelea kukue. No. So, the pastor tells the woman, have you tried to be violent with it? Have you been, have you, want, how, my, how much have you wanted it? And the woman is like, uh, you know, I've wanted it so much. Should I pinch them? Should I? And like, no. The problem is that you have not wanted it to the point of violence. What does that mean? You have heard of people saying, I am praying and fasting for God to give me one, two, three things. Now, when we say that, we are not communicating that it is that the Lord will see how much najifinya. Aone, hey, uya mekosa chakula, siku 60. Malaika mpatieni kabla kufe, mpatieni kabla kufe. That's not it. Our fasting does not do anything to God. It does not move the needle with God. If you're fasting because you think it's going to untwist God to giving you what you want, just start eating today. I have told you as your pastor in Jesus' name. Go and eat a big meal and enjoy it. If that is the reason you're fasting. If you are fasting, it must be because you have said within yourself, I am desiring this thing so much. So I will shut myself in with the Lord and pray and seek and agonize over this thing until either God gives me this thing or he speaks to me concerning his will for me concerning this thing. 
Because sometimes the Lord will give you something. Sometimes it is not his will for you. So what does he do? While you're praying and fasting, the Lord, you, because your mind is clear, you're able to hear him say to you, Iyo hata unaitisha wacha. Sikupi. Ni kama mtu mwenye anasema ati, I'm praying and fasting. For, to, to. Let me give an example again about Pastor Richard. Pastor Richard and Pastor Barry are married. For many years they have children. I was at their wedding. I was an usher at their wedding. Okay, I know, yeah. I was... I, I, I was among the first people to eat in that wedding. I remember that much. <laughs> the wedding was in Rongai. Um, so imagine some lady just comes to church and she tells me, Pastor Brian, I want you to join me in praying and fasting because I want a man. I'm like, oh, my sister, yes, we want that. Let's pray. And she tells me, yeah, actually, it's a man that you know. So please, as you're praying, just so that I'm telling you, just so that you can have insight as you're praying. And the man is Pastor Richard. You know for sure, me, I'm not joining that prayer. I'm like, it shall not be so. In fact, you shall not receive your answers. She says, even if you all receive, refuse, I'm going to agonize in praying and fasting. I have set, declared in my household, a kopekeake, human being, okay. I have declared a 40-day fast. I am fasting for the man of God. Do you think, even if she fasted like the prophets of Baal, with cutting herself and rolling on the ground, that the Lord will deliver Pastor Richard to her? Absolutely not. But in the place of fasting, if she's truly crying out to God, the Lord will send his ministering angels to just beat her from the floor and tell her, stop that foolishness. Get up and go outside. Accept the coffee that the young man is asking you about. Leave other people's husbands alone. So the thought of the kingdom of God suffered violence. We have already talked about the violence that ha took, it took for the kingdom to be communicated to us. And that the violent take it by force. It's not that now we do everything to have our own way. No, no, no. It is that I feel something so deeply to the point that I agonize over this thing. I sit down and I am asking that the Lord would give me this thing. If I am agonizing for the salvation of my children, I sit down and I pray about it constantly, every day. I enroll people to join me in prayer. I do everything in my power to pray about this thing. As I am praying genuinely, the Lord will communicate his will concerning this thing, or he will give that thing to me. That is what it looks like. So the pastor is saying to this woman, if you want them to be born again, have you agonized over their souls? Or do you just come and tell them, Jesus loves me, this I know. Amen. Go home. And then you meet them again on Sunday. No, if you're agonizing over their souls, if you're going to be violent, because the violent take it by force, in between the week, do you have a list of their names that you can pray over little Timmy and little John and little Jerry and little Jaden, because Jaden must give his life to Christ, and little Jaden and all of them, you're praying over them day and night, agonizing over them in prayer. That before you meet them next Sunday, to tell them about Jesus, during the week, you have met Jesus to tell him about them. That is what it looks to have the violent take it by force. Do you want it and how badly do you want this thing? It's not just a, a way of just have us having what we want. Just, hmm, hmm, um, what do I want? Oh, this thing. Okay, this looks this pretty, pretty, wonderful. Natakayo Gary. Okay, so God give me a car. God give me a car. That's, it's a very ineffective way of approaching that portion of scripture. If you think about what the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, starts by saying, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another, and then you'll find healing. The, because the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, effective means well thought out. For it to be effective, you need to, it needs to bear results. Sour. Sour. So effective means you're sitting down. We're talking about prayer. You sit down, you plan for it. You are thinking about a time of prayer. Now, you can't have effective prayer must be planned for prayer. I know there are some of you who are in the house and are saying, hey, me, I'm going to go to the house. 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 And it's fine. Um, let me give a story. Yesterday, we were somewhere, and uh, at the team we were with was telling us they went to Lamu for ministry. And, you know, in Lamu, those days, stronghold, stronghold, they are shetani kwa kweli. So they used to decide they will wake up at three, before the imam wakes up to do the prayer, the, the what is it called? The call to prayer. Um, they will wake up before them, and they will charge the atmosphere. Just charge the atmosphere in prayer. You people that love to pray, you know what I'm talking about. You wake up in the midnight hour, it's just a rebako to lobos before the imam wakes up, yeah? 
So, and they did that for a week, for the week that they were there. But one of the days, you know, sometimes your body catches up with you. You're tired. Kweli si kweli. So they tried to wake up. They were just tired. They tried. Because they were not just praying. During the day, they would go out for missions and doing door to door in Lamu. And, you know, it was just a lot. And the sun was scorching and hot. And so some of the days, but two of them, they thought about you, this is a spiritual attack. We are unable to wake up because of what? So they started praying in their beds and they felt strength come into their bodies. And they woke up, two of them, they came to the sitting room. Out of a team of like 12, only two made it to the sitting room that day where they were supposed to pray. And so they came and they prayed. And then from three, and then, yo. He started to call the call to prayer. It used to find them when they're there. Like in Sasa, I hey, by the time Anakuja, we have already taken captive of the atmosphere, nothing shall. So they continue to pray. At around six, <laughs> three hours later, now the other members were melalala, sawa, kaskia, wakona kanguvu, wakakuja. And they were feeling so bad. And I Aki, brothers, we are so sorry. We felt so difficult. And so they are all just looking there. And they are saying, it's okay now that you've come. Let's just, let's just pray. Then the pastor who was hosting them, um, he used to come and join them for breakfast in the morning at around 6.30. So he came at 6.30 and he found them in that one Ulizana, oh, my brother, tukweza kukuja maombi, oh, tumeshindua, oh, leo, chetani ametueza. And so the pastor was telling them, enter rest. When I came here to Lamu to start doing ministry from Nairobi, I also came like that. Nilikuwa ninaamuka saa nane, nitangulie uwa shetani before wakuje. And then over time I realized, with the kind of ministry I'm doing here, it is not practical for me to wake up like that every day. Once in a while when the Lord prompts me, I will wake up. But I have a set time of prayer. When I wake up, even I wake up at five. When I wake up at five, I will still do prayer, effective prayer. And so he was saying to them, enter rest. Because let them go ahead. But when we wake up, we cover ground. It is exactly what Elijah was saying to the prophets of Baal on the mountain, wasn't it? He's saying, take the whole day. Water the ombeni, muiteni, oh, maybe he's asleep. Call him, call him, call him. Elijah was not like, hey, watcha, watcha tuombe kabla wa anza kuomba. You see, that's the thing about the believer. We have been given so much power, we have a head start. Calvary gave us a head start. A head start, light years ahead, the people of God. It's light years and in of distance or time. It's distance, yes. We have been given the advantage by Calvary. But just because we have the advantage, you cannot afford not to pray. You must pray. So whether you are of the school of thought for waking up at 12 to defeat the devil before he wakes up, or you are of the school of thought for waking up at 5, you must wake up. Okay, maybe you don't want to wake up. It's fine. If you want to pray at 5 in the evening, or at 8, jioni, ukitoka job, nisawa, unaomba. That's the thing. Are you praying? But then, when you think about are we just praying, then remember we've said the effective prayer. Effective, the people of God, is it has results. For it to be effective, it means I am giving God good time. You're so tired. You've gotten to the house, traffic, watu wamekuingia kwa barabara, umewafuata, barabara nzima, your journey was longer because ule alikuingia hivi, ukasema umkimbize kidogo muonyeshe whose car is better. Umepita exit ya kwako. Unajua umeshinda ukikimbiza na nashetani. She's been fighting with the devil the whole day. Unnecessary fights. Alafu sasa umeingia kwa nyumba, your children are here, they want to play with you. By the time you're putting them to sleep, and you unakiti sasa unanza kusema, Amen, I love you, Lord. You will love the Lord in your sleep, my brother. That will not be effective prayer. So effective means unakiti chini unajipanga. I know some, we like to think about prayer like a spiritual activity, and it is. But it requires you to also sit down and be thoughtful about it. What are my best hours? What time can I have effective time with God? This may not be the same in this service as it was in the youth service. But in the youth service, we were just asking the question. Do you know those conversations you, you talk with somebody in the dead of night? Umechoka, umechoka. Ata ujui kama mlimaliza mku ambiana good night. Ulilala tu. Uka amuka katikati ya usiku. Tulikata simu, tuliongea. Nina, tulisema nini? Iyo ndio ile wakati unajiuliza. Don't give God those kinds of times. 
Give him on your flesh. Effective prayer, by the way, can be, you could pray for 10 minutes and be more effective than me who has prayed for two hours. Because if I am praying for two hours and I am just saying the same thing over and over again, or in my two hours I have said so many, I have called God so many times, and we've talked about this here when we're talking about prayer. So I'm like, oh, my Father, my God, my King of glory. You're so wonderful, my God, King of glory. You're so great, my God, King of glory. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to my God, King of glory. Come against my God, King of glory. The devil, my God, King of glory. Because the devil, my God, King of glory. You're like, are we coming against my God, King of glory, or the devil? Because my God, King of glory, the devil, King of glory. It's just like, it's a bit confusing. Tell your neighbor, relax. Effective prayer, atukimbizani namtu namongelesha mpenzi wangu jamani alie mbinguni. The same way you talk to your beloved spouse or the same way you talk to somebody you love, the same way you talk to your children. I'm not just like Mukasa, my brother, my brother Mukasa. You know I love you, my brother Mukasa. Mukasa, I just wanted to tell you, my brother Mukasa, your black shirt, my brother Mukasa, is very beautiful, my brother Mukasa. What are you saying? And then I come out of there saying, for two hours I've been in prayer, for two hours. If I took your two hours and filtered them out, nitoe ma salutations na ma titles, ime back in only five minutes of saying, God, remember me as I go to work today. Sasi nichukue tu your five minutes, ni seme, God, remember me as I go back to work today, have the results of it, and then the remaining one hour that I wasted doing salutations, just spend it doing on that work. Effective. The, the final part is fervent. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Fervent means heartfelt, hot prayers. You see, many times we don't receive the answers to the things we are asking for because we don't even care about those things. We are busy asking God to care for things that we don't care about ourselves. You tell somebody, listen, my brother, um, my mom is not feeling well, and they're like, ah, 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 I will pray for your mother. And you actually do, you pray for that mother, but you will never go back to ask whether that mother died or that mother is okay, that mother is walking, you don't care about that mother. You made it as a mention just so that you're not called a liar. And God, I thank you for the mother of Naninini in Jesus' name. You do not care. Whether the mother lives or dies, you have no ataikus. And many times we are caught up in asking God for things that whether he gave them to us or he didn't, it wouldn't make a difference. Now, fervent prayer is the one that avails much. It says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. The heartfelt prayer of a righteous man. That I care for the things I'm asking God to care about. That if I am praying for my sister, Betha, I am praying for her and her family. I am praying for the things that concern her. And so that means when I, am, when I receive in the place of prayer, I feel like I need to pray for Betha. I will reach out to my sister, Betha. And ask her, my sister, I am in prayer for you. Is there anything you'd like me to mention? You see, that's a good way of even building fellowship. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. You see, the thing about the fervent prayer is that it is exactly what Jesus is talking about. He talks about the violent shall take it by force. Because if you're fervent about something, you are careful about that thing. You spend day and night agonizing over this thing. If you're trusting for the salvation of a loved one, day and night agonizing over it, you have refused to give up until that person says, I will give my life to Christ. I read about, um, I forget his name, one of these Christian patriarchs from back in the day who died. And he maintained a prayer journal. And in that prayer journal, he had a list of people, members of the family and friends who he desired that will give their lives to Christ. And he prayed for them fervently. Every day he prayed for them. And every time one of them gave their lives to Christ, he went back to his prayer journal and crossed it out. And it was a public thing. He let them know. And he prayed for them. In devotions with his family, he would make mention of the names of these, prayers, of these people. He would make mention of them and pray for them. The violent take it by force. He did not give up. Even when he saw some of them that he's praying for are even going worse and worse. Moyo mbea mtu alafu badala apone anaendelea kuingia kwa shida za dunia. Nambea mtu waokoke lakini unasikia sasa hata alikuwa anatumia tu pombe, sasa hata anatumia banki. Wasama he, wacha ni achane na hewi wamekua wa shetani basi. No, the violent take it by force. You continue to labor in the place of prayer. Things are getting worse, but you say, this, my child, shall not go to the pits. This one we ask for in prayer. We shall keep them in prayer. The Lord shall bring it to pass. 
You are trusting that things will go better in the office. Then all of a sudden they are just dipping. Everybody is against you. Your bosses are just... You don't stop praying. You say, ah, why has the Lord left me and I'm on his side after everything I have done for him? No. Continue in the place of prayer because it is the violent that shall take it by force. The Bible says that... Uh, not the Bible. The, the story goes that when this, all these people... When this man finally died, by the time he was dying... Everyone on his list but one had given his life to Christ. And it reads like a story. Because on the day of the funeral of this man, after all the things were read and the eulogy was read and everybody was saying how a wonderful man of God this person was and all the works that he did for the Lord God Almighty. On that day, when they were finishing, when the preacher finished preaching and made an altar call because of how passionate this man was concerning evangelism, that one friend was in the funeral. He lifted his hand and said he wants to give his life to Jesus Christ. So the work of this man was accomplished because the violent take it by force. One more time, allow me to read it. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I want you to take a moment and just ask yourself within you, what are the things that concern you? Remember earlier, we talked about it and we said Jesus responding to the disciples of John the Baptist says, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That you carry within you the culture of the unoffendable heart. And you're not offended by God. You're not thinking, why would God not come to visit me and break me out of the prison I am in? Why is, not God sending, why is God not sending me answers? Why is God not rescuing me? Why is God not seeing my situation? After all I do for him, after I am so faithful and serving him, consider the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Consider that even though there is nothing wrong they were doing, God had scripted their story. And consider that your story is also scripted by God. Consider the lilies of the field and how beautifully they are dressed. It is not possible that God who thinks about those ones is not thinking about you. So refuse to be offended. I know some of us may be offended in the house today by God. You're offended because God has not come the way you thought he would come when he thought he would come. You're offended when you see him visiting other people. I pray that you will lift up your voice now and say, God, take away offense from my heart. Remove it in the name of Jesus. I am offended because there is delay in my life. And I know you can do it and you're still not doing it. Remove that offense. Instead, help me to understand that you have scripted my story in the name of Jesus Christ. The rest of us are in the house and we have been so tired and we are refusing. We are, we are just giving up. With just a little bit of inconvenience, we give up. Us that the Lord would stir you up to understand that even the kingdom did not come lightly. It it was communicated to us through power and the display of God's power on the cross. Therefore, for you, those who will have it will receive it by force. What that looks like is that you will spend, in the time, spend time in the place of prayer. You will tarry. You will ask the Lord to help you. You will push. You will take it to the Lord in prayer. You will take it to Jesus in prayer. Come and lift up your voice. You're praying for yourself. You're asking the Lord to remove offense. You're asking the Lord to turn you around. You're asking the Lord to do away with that chip on your shoulder. That privilege that you feel like you have over everybody else just because you're a Christian. Fix your eyes on what the Lord is doing around you. Let that encourage you to know that even though you've not been broken out of prison, he is right there with you in the prison. Ask the Lord to help you, that you will have a strong heart, a hardened heart, a heart that can bear through the things of this life, that you will be counted among those ones that will take it by force in the name of Jesus. Master, we thank you for your sons and daughters here today. We thank you because as we've listened to your word, you've spoken to us, not just generally, but by your Holy Spirit, you've gone into every one of our lives and you're telling us what we need to do. You're calling us, oh God, to do some changes here and there. I pray that, Lord, we would listen to the sound of your voice in the name of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, you would take away offense from our hearts and that you would help us to trust in you and to trust in your timing in the name of Jesus want to pray especially for those ones who are in the house today. And Lord, they are feeling like they are just tired. They are feeling like they want to throw in the towel. Indeed, some of them have already thrown in the towel, yet they came to the house today. I pray for such whose hearts are heavy laden. Encourage them one more time to go into the place of seeking your face, to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Encourage their hearts to seek you, O God, that they may find you. Encourage them to be fervent in the place of seeking you in prayer. Encourage them to bring their needs and their issues to you. Just like they came today, encourage them to come to you tomorrow and the day after and the days after until 
until you finally bring it to pass in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak a blessing over your people that wherever they go this week, that they shall encounter you, they shall encounter your presence, they shall encounter, oh God, the very grace that you've set out for them in the different spaces you'll send them this week. We call them victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ because we pray these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.